Welcome home. Welcome home. I walked out at the wrong time there. For the last seven months, we would just edit that out. I got to get out of that habit, I guess. Man, it's good to be here. I was um, having a hard time getting through worship without weeping. I shared with the Dream Team this morning a story out of Ezra and Nehemiah where the people of God hadn't been together to worship in 70 years. They hadn't been able to come into his presence and lift up his worship. And the temple was being rebuilt and the walls were being restored and they had only laid the foundation. That's all. They had just gotten the foundation down and it says that the people erupted into worship and shouts of praise. They couldn't contain it. And that's how I feel this morning. I feel like I'm just, I'm so happy to be here with you. I want to talk about foundations today. Let me pray before I do it. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for who you are, God. I thank you that you are always good, that you've always been faithful, that you never leave us, you never abandon us, you never step away, not even for one moment, that God, in every season, good and bad, you're there. And so we honor you today. We worship you as we see your foundation laid out before us. We can only respond in praise. You are good. You are so good so good. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. See if I can get through this here today. I've got my doubts. All right. Get yourself together, John Mark. Pull it together. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, everybody. We're so honored to have you here with us to our first in-person gathering in seven months. Seven months. Gosh, it, it, it is so good. And to everybody that is online this morning, we honor you. We are excited to have you with us. We're so excited to be worshiping with you as well. Thank you for being here as well. Th this, is, this has been just a season of, of change. You know, I think that all of us coming into this place today are different than the last time we entered into a house of worship. And I think that that's okay, you know. I think as you look back and you enter into a new season, there's always going to be change, good and bad, and um, we move on and we move forward and we, we, keep, we keep pressing in. And I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm going to stop rambling and get to it because I've got a lot of things I want to say today and I haven't had anybody to preach to but our incredible production team for a long time. So goodness knows, I'm going to try to keep it concise, but I might get excited today. Um, huge thanks, huge thanks to our staff and our amazing dream team for all the hard work you did to get us here right now. You guys crushed it. Robert Knight, Mikey Holmes, Sarah Antonor back there and your kids. I mean, uh, and Robbie Dentz, all you guys, man. We, we, and then this, this dream team, man. I'm telling you, our production team and all the work over the last seven months, the way our kids team has continually produced incredible content, everybody who has shown up over the last two weekends to set this all up and learn a whole new system with us, thank you. We, we, we see you. We're, we're grateful for you. We're honored to have you on our team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And a big welcome uh, to everybody who's here for the first time today. I met some people coming in. It was their first time coming. Welcome. We're on. Welcome to the family. We're glad to have you. Today is a special day to be joining us. And today is it's a special day. What I want to talk about is foundations, foundations. I've been thinking about what it was like to worship just in the foundation of that temple and the foundations of who we are. Because in a season of change and even in a season of crisis, I think a lot of times it strips away a lot of what was added on and what was ornamental and what we're left with is the foundations of things. And so before we move on, we got, I'm excited. We got a series coming up called Mistakes Were Made and it's going to be fun. We're going to just talk all about the ways we get, we get it wrong. But today, before we get into that, before we do any of that, 
I just want to take today just to talk about who we are, why we're here, and what the foundations of this church are. You know, Jesus spoke about foundations. He said this in Matthew chapter 7, everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I'm going to blow my nose. It's not COVID. I've been crying a lot. All right. We're living in the storm right now. We're living, the winds are out there, the rain is falling hard. We're living in this storm right now, and the world is in turmoil and chaos. And if you have the wrong foundation, you also are in turmoil and chaos. If you build your foundation in what the world says is right, in the leaders of the world, in the condition of the world, then right now you're like the house built on sand, falling apart, shifting, shaking, worried, and afraid. But if we can learn to build our foundation not on this world, but on the world that is to come. If we find our foundation in Jesus and the way that he's called us to live and on what he, who he has called us to be, then even though the wind and the rain are here, even though the world is falling apart around us and breaking open at the seams, we are fixed on a firm foundation and we are solid and we keep our bearing and we know who we are and we know where we're going and we know what we're made to do even in times like the ones we're living through right now. So with that in mind, I wanna talk about the foundations of our church today, the foundations. I've got just already a voice that echoes and in this room it is incredible. You gotta, be in, you gotta come check this, if you're online, you gotta, this, is, this is, is freaking me out. I'm like, God, I'm like, God, whoever's talking to me needs to chill down a little bit. It's me. I can be chill. I'm nervous. I haven't talked in front of people in a long time. I titled this message today, Why Are We Here? Why Are We Here? Maybe some of you are with me in the YMCA today, or you're online and you're wondering, why, why are we here? What's going on? Why are we here? I'm going to answer that in the most simple way that I can this morning. You see, we, the Gathering Church, the reason that we exist, the reason we are here is to lead people to know God, find freedom, discover our purpose, and make a difference. We believe that this is the greatest mission there is, and I want to just take a few minutes today to tell you why. These four purposes, this journey, this spiritual pathway that we try so hard to walk people through as a church, it exists all throughout the Bible. In fact, I believe that this is the plan that God has for us to move forward and to move on. And we see it all over Scripture, but it begins as a promise in Exodus chapter 6. It's one of the first times that the people of God have heard from him in hundreds of years. And they've been enslaved to the Egyptians for 400 years. And God makes a promise to them that he reaffirms over and over through the story of Scripture. He makes a covenant with Israel that the Jewish people still celebrate in the Passover Seder. And it goes like this, verse 6. Uh, Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This is the promise of salvation. God has, makes a promise to reveal himself to his people and bring them into relationship with him. And this is what it means to know God. This is where we get that idea to know God. Next he says, I will free you from being slaves to them. God says he's gonna free them from slavery after he's already taken them out of Egypt. How many of us know that sometimes we can be out of Egypt, but Egypt can still be in us? We may have entered into a relationship with Jesus, but all those things that were making our hearts muddy before we got into a relationship with Jesus, they're still there. We've still got a lot of freedom to find, a lot of work to do. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will redeem you. Through his power, we have the opportunity to be redeemed. Redemption is just a word that we use that means to set, be set back to your original purpose. God wants to take you from whatever path you found yourself on, and he wants to pick you up and set you right back in the place he always intended for you to be, redemption. 
the, the act of redemption, and that is when we discover our purpose and we shift. After we discover our purpose, we shift from all these personal, individual promises to being a group of people. It says in verse 7, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. I will make you my people, and I will be your God. It's all you, 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 and then it's a y'all. Y'all, it shifts. Together as his freed people, we make a difference by using our gifts and talents together in the purpose we were made for. And when we do, when we make it this far, we find satisfaction that comes from the inside out. That's the Old Testament. That, that's Exodus deliverance stuff. It's a little bit intimidating. I always like best these four purposes the way they're explained in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 61, we see it again. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. We exist to lead people to know God. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners. We are here to help people find freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. We discover our purpose. We get taken from being broken, mourning, in captivity. We are trapped in our sin, chained up, lost, forgotten, and God rescues us in relationship. He frees us from our chains, and then he sets us up like a mighty oak tree, and we discover our purpose. And then it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places. Those who were ruined begin to rebuild the ruins. And this was always his plan. This exists over two dozen times in Scripture, some form of it. This was always his plan that we might know him first without any other, any other qualifications, without any other steps ahead of it. To know God, it only means that you've begun to ask, who are you? To enter into relationship with him. No requirements of you other than a willingness to enter into that relationship, to know God, and then to find freedom, to get rid of all those things in our hearts that are holding us back. Once we're free, we can discover our purpose. Our eyes are clear to see. It says in Ephesians that your eyes might be made clear so that your heart can see, and then we make a difference as the people of God. We begin to reach into the lives of those who were just like we were not so long ago and rescue them from the place that they're in where we once were. We make a difference together. This is the plan God put together for his people and for his church. Jesus reads this passage in Isaiah in Luke chapter 4, and he declares it again in the New Testament as his mission statement and ultimately as the mission of the church. I'm telling you all of this because after this season, I just want it to be crystal clear that our methods have changed, but our mission is the same. That as the church, we are here because there are more than 56,000 people in the city of Asheville alone who have not yet walked that journey, who are lonely, scared, broken, and lost, and it is nobody's responsibility, nobody's job, but ours as followers of Jesus to lead them on this pathway to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference. And so I say it again, we are here at church, because first, we need, we need to lead people to know God. We need to lead people to know God. The how doesn't matter, the why does. Anyone who knows me well knows that I love movies. And you know what, I think it's God's providence that the movie theater opens the same weekend as the, as the gathering church. You know, I think that's like a sign. That's like God saying, hey, John Mark, I'm going to take care of you, my man. It's going to be a good weekend. I love the movies. I go to the movies as much as possible. Y'all, I, I will drive to another state to see a movie if I have to. Whether or not I've done it is my business, and I don't need your judgment for it, okay? All right? And so I love movies, and, I, and because I love movies so much because I'm a student of stories, 
I love sto- I like good stories and bad stories. I like sto- I like to watch somebody begin in one place, go through a crisis, go through an experience, go through a quest, an adventure, and I love to see all the ways that they change by the end of that story. I love to watch people's hearts long for something, and I like to see what happens when they get the thing they longed for, and I like to see what happens when they don't. I love to watch stories. I'm obsessed. I'm a student of stories. And I've seen thousands of movies. I will see whatever comes to the movie theater, good or bad, minus horror movies. Those give me nightmares. I don't do it. But anything else, I'm going to go. 5% on Rotten Tomatoes, 100%. I'm at the movies, okay? And what I've learned over and over again is that there is one story that's told more than any other, and that is somebody's search for meaning. The search for meaning. It's the most common tale that we see on the silver screen. The, the person's desire to matter. And we get to watch it play out. And Hollywood always has an answer that, that bows up at the end that's nice and neat. Well, they found their meaning because they helped somebody or they found their meaning because they got the, they found, you know, the, they, they discovered the kingdom of the crystal skull. It's a terrible reference. They, they, found, they found their meaning. But what I know is that that search for meaning that we see played out in the story over and over again isn't a desire for people to find a person. It's not a desire for people to do something important. It's a desire that was placed in us in our creation, not just to know our why, but it's our desire to know who. Who made me? Why am I here? What am I doing in this place? People search for meaning in power and positions. They search for it in influence. They search in experiences and money. And so often, we search for it in other people. We think other people are going to fulfill us. But all of these things only ever offer a temporary solution. In the end, all of it is meaningless. Solomon wrote it in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The only thing that brings us the meaning we are looking for is knowing God. I know that in the deepest parts of my soul. And because I know that, I am compelled to share it. The only way that we can know God is through a relationship with Jesus. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. And by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. The reality is that we all spend a season of our lives, whether you were entered into a relationship with God young or old, it doesn't matter. We all spend a season trying to answer these questions, trying to discover our who, trying to discover why, trying to find meaning, trying to figure it out, trying to put the pieces together. And because our paths take us in all of these wrong directions, we deserve less than what we got. Because it says in verse 4, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. This is good news. This is the gospel message of hope that we have to give to the world. And it's why we're here in our city as a church. It's why we're here today in person meeting at the Y again. It's why we go to all the effort to bring you this message online. The last seven months have been just as much, if not more work than doing this, but we believe that it is worth it, that every ounce of it is worth it, that it's not work when it's your purpose, that we were called to this and we have this truth, this message of hope inside of us that we are compelled to share in whatever way we can. We need to lead people 
to know God. We believe that one of the very best places for us to lead people to know God is through our Sunday experiences. Whether it's online or in person, we have to give it everything that we've got to create an environment for people to have their barriers, walls, and expectations removed so they can hear the life-changing message of Jesus and begin to know God. We believe that Sundays in person are an incredible avenue for that because people not only get to hear the good news in a message, but they get to experience it in people. All along, the plan was for those two things to work together. What I do is not the most important thing that happens here on Sunday morning. It's about us being God's people together, wondering, when someone comes in wondering what this whole thing is about, they see it on the faces of his people as they enter into his house for worship, and it is the whole thing that compels us to know God more. People are desperately searching for peace, for hope, for meaning, and my belief, my conviction, my worldview is that they will only ever find those things in knowing God. And so our church's foundation is that we need to lead people to know God because that knowing God, the gospel message, is hope. And it's what people are looking for. And once we get them to that place, we need to lead people to find freedom we need to lead as the church. It's not just our responsibility to share with people the gospel so that they might know God. It's also our responsibility to lead them to find freedom because those chains, they hurt. And we've all got baggage, don't we? I've got some baggage. We've all got some baggage. Let me see some baggage. We've got some baggage. None of y'all have baggage. Everyone in this room's got it all. I'm just kidding. We, we all got baggage. You, you know what? Here's the thing, too. I meant to say this in the beginning. I was watching y'all come in this morning, and we have forgotten how to interact with people, haven't we? I was, uh, some of y'all were talking to me, and I was like, oh, are you talking to me? And then I was talking to some of y'all, and you later be like, back up, bro. Get back. You're getting too. We're all, we, I get it. I get it. We're going to get through this together. We're going to break through the awkwardness of re-entering society together as a people. We can do this. And so I, I, we've all got some baggage, don't we? Who's got some baggage? Let me see some hands. Yeah, we've all got some baggage. We carry it along with us everywhere that we go. We drag it. And sometimes it's more than just baggage holding us back. It's chains wrapped around us. We're walking around and we are bound to our sin, bound to our guilt, bound to the shame of our our past. It's all we can think about. It keeps us from being happy. It keeps us from being healthy. It keeps us from having purpose. And maybe it's mistakes you've made and you're likely to make again. Maybe it's sin from your past, sin in your present. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's the wrong way of thinking. The psalmist said it like this in Psalm 107, verse 10 through 14. He says, some sat in darkness in utter darkness, like prisoners suffering in iron chains. I think so many of us can relate to what that feels like. I know what it feels like to sit in darkness like a prisoner in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. We, we, we may not always think of it like, oh, I'm being rebellious to God. We may just think, I'm just trying to live my life and figure it out on my own. But it's enough. We go against the way that he's called us to live, and it makes us feel isolated and alone. And so it says, he subjected them to bitter labor, and they stumbled, and there was nowhere to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. And he brought them out of darkness, that utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Our God is a chain breaker, not a chain maker. It's who he is, it's his character, it's his nature. When we say, God, I need freedom, God says, I wanna give you freedom. Jesus says he came to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. As a church, we have to do whatever we can to help people find the freedom they've been promised. I think sometimes as Christians, as evangelists, we get this mixed up, we forget how important this one is. We do a good job of leading people into a relationship with Jesus and then we move on to the next one. And I, I'm, I'm wired this way. I'm excited to get, I love to see that light bulb switch when somebody comes into a first time relationship with Jesus. It's easy for me to say, that's great. Next, who's next? You look like you need Jesus. And go on, you know, and 
And I, I'm constantly reminding myself how crucial it is to make sure you've, you've got Jesus. Now let me show you how to live in freedom. It says in Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. See, so often Christ set us free, but we're not enjoying the freedom that he's given us. And a lot of times, it's because we don't know how. And church, this is where we come in. Because our role, our role as a community is to help one another live in the freedom we've been given. We, we believe as a church that finding freedom is a group project, that it's not something we can easily do on our own, that it's hard on our own. Sometimes it's impossible on our own. You need a guide. In fact, even the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, once he entered into a relationship with Jesus, God right away sent him to somebody that would help him find his way. We need someone to help us find freedom. That is why community is so crucial. That's why we believe life groups are so important. Because we need a place where we can take our mask off. And that's a funny thing to say right now. I don't mean this mask, okay? If your life group leader asks you to wear this mask, wear this mask. Some of y'all complaining about wearing masks to church, but you've been wearing masks to church your whole life. Oh no, I should not have said that. I regret it right away. But it's the truth. See, we're just so used to putting that mask on. I'm good, I'm fine. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm good. Everything's good. No, for the last seven months, I've worried every day that I'm going to lose my job. But I'm good. It's fine. I'm feeling good. I've been taking up all the old habits that I thought I was free of again to deal with this stress. But I'm good. Everything's fine. I'm good. I'm wearing my mask. I'm looking okay. But you need a place where you can go and you can say, I'm falling apart. I'm not okay. I've taken up every addiction I thought I was free of. I, I, I'm worried every minute of every day. I'm scared and I'm afraid. And you need someone to say, you know what? Me too. Yeah, I'm living that way. I, I see you. And then, and then you need someone to say, you know what? I was there. I was just, I was just there. And here's what I'm doing to get better. Here's the way God's brought me through it. That's how a community is supposed to work. See, we can offer the life group structure, but I can't make you take your mask off. So for it to work, we've got to do it together. We've got to, once we get freedom, we've got to be passionately searching for the next person that we can help lead to freedom. And if we don't have freedom, we don't need to act like we do. We need to act. We need to pursue. We need to search for every way that we can to get free because it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. We need to lead people to find freedom. Because freedom gives us peace. Oh, we're so desperate for peace in this season, aren't we? Oh, we're desperate for it. We, need, we just want a moment where we feel okay. You need to find freedom to get that peace. And we need, once we help people find freedom, once those chains start to break, and you know what? There's always gonna be a link here, a padlock that you gotta break. There's always a little bit of work. You're never done finding freedom. Finding freedom is never a quick process either. It's not just one semester of life group. I'm good. Thank goodness I took care of that. I'm moving on, feeling good, looking good, ready to go. That's not how it works. Finding freedom takes time. And it depends on how wrapped up you are. It could take a long time. And sometimes we spend our lives finding freedom from different things. That's okay. But once you get those big chains off and your heart starts to open up a little bit and you can see, church, we need to lead people to discover their purpose. We need to lead people to discover their purpose because you have a purpose. And until you find it, you will always be looking for it. The two best days in somebody's life are the day they're born and the day they discover why they were born. We have a why. You have a purpose. You were made not just to drift through, not just to go to work, go home, go to work, go home, go to a movie, go to, you're not made for that. You were created to do great things in the name of Jesus. You were created to serve God in a way that glorifies him, to serve people in a way that glorifies him. You were created with gifts, dreams, passions, desires that he only gave to you. And your church and your city desperately need you to discover it so you can step into it so he can make a difference through you in it. We need to lead people to discover their purpose. And until we do, they will always be looking for it. In an interview in 2012, Tom Brady, the greatest football player of all time, said this, 
Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and I still think there's something greater out there for me? I just think there has to be more than this. I was watching a show called Down to Earth with Zac Efron. I loved it and I love him. And the actor admitted, without purpose, all the fame and fortune feels meaningless. One of history's richest kings, King Solomon, wrote in Ecclesiastes 2.11, yet when I considered all the works that my hands had accomplished and what I had toiled to achieve, I found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. My point is that everyone is aware of their need for purpose and as the church, our role, our duty, our responsibility is to help them discover it. We are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good works planned for us long ago. God made you with an assignment in mind. He could see the lives that were gonna change because of your purpose as he formed you. I believe that as a church, our role is to help people discover their purpose and have an outlet to use it. That's why we do the growth track. If you're new, we do something called the growth track and it is very simple. It is very simple. We just have a conversation with you to try and help you discern what has always been in you. Beginning October 18th here, we'll be having growth track. We're working on an online option for that, but here, October 18th, we'll be doing growth track again right after service. And we believe this is so important because we want you to know your why. That's why we believe serving on the dream team matters. Not because it fills positions on our team, but because it fills your need to be a part of the mission of the church. And in doing so, it gives you a sense of purpose. It doesn't fill a position on the team. It fills a position in your hearts. Paul says, my job, my job, is to equip, to equip all of us to be the ones who do the ministry. First Peter 4.12, Peter, not Paul, says, and it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. He gave these gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Here's what that means, that it is not my job to reach our city for the gospel of Jesus. It is not my job to be the one who is Jesus to our city. My job is to equip, to train, to offer every resource I can, to do whatever I can do with the limited gifting given to me to help you change the city that you live in. That's what we're committed to, to help you discover your purpose so that together we can be the church. We want to lead people down this pathway to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose so they can finally see their purpose. And then it's our role here at the church to equip you for the work of ministry so that together we can make a difference. We want to help you discover your purpose because purpose gives us joy. Purpose gives us Joy. Joy is different than happiness. Joy is something that comes from deep down inside. Joy is unshakable. Joy doesn't move. Joy doesn't shift when bad news comes across your feed. Joy is what God offers. And it's what we find when we gain our purpose. And once we live in our purpose, then together, we will make a difference. And our city will never, ever be the same. This is why we're here. I'm naive enough to think that we can make a dent in the darkness of this city. 56,000 people in Asheville don't know Jesus. Over 100,000 in our surrounding areas. We exist to make that number smaller, to empty out hell and fill up heaven. And we exist to do it together. In that promise back in Exodus 6, God says, you will be my people and I will be your God. No longer is the promise about you, it's about y'all. We are in this all together as one. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15 says, we are God's co-workers in building God's service, in God's service. You are God's field, God's building, and by the grace God has given me, I've laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on that. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is in Jesus Christ. This is our foundation. This is the foundation that we're building on. This is why we do all of this, 
It's why we think it's so important to be here, to be a part of this, to be a part of this family. Together, we're co-workers, co-builders in making our church a place where people learn to know God and find freedom and discover their purpose and make a difference. <laughs> Robbie always says, Pastor Robbie, our executive pastor, uh, we get it wrong sometimes. We don't always do it right. We haven't always gotten it right in the last seven months, that's for sure. Robbie always reminds me when I'm feeling bad about how we missed it. You know, man, we, we're not a great church. <laughs> we're a good one. And this is a place where people know God. For the first time, I'll never forget the first time I understood that God wanted me regardless of what I had done. I'll never forget the first time that I understood that God wanted me to know him and that I was good enough for that. And I'll never forget the feeling, it took, it took a long time, but when those chains started to loosen up and they started to fall, and I'm, for the first time in my entire life felt free. I'll never, I remember the first worship service after I had made a big breakthrough in freedom. I'll never forget the way it felt to worship in freedom. I remember the day I discovered my why, the moment it became clear to me why God put me on this earth, why I was, why I am the way I am. People have been wondering for years, why am I the way I am? I got that answer. And I get to show up and make a difference every Sunday. And I have so much peace and so much joy. And you know, the, it's windy out there. The rain's falling, sand's shifting. Every day there's another reason to give up on humanity. But my foundation, it's not built in this world. It's not built on our economy. It's not built on sickness or health. It's not built on any of that. My foundation is built on this. It's built on Jesus. And so all of that can fall apart around me and I will stand strong and I will keep doing exactly what it is God has put me on this earth to do. I may have to figure out new ways to do it. The how might change, but the why never will. I'm gonna stay fixed and fixated because my foundation never moves. It is solid rock. And so church, this is our foundation. This is why we're here. What we do may change, or how we do it may change, but what we do never will. We are here to lead people to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference over and over and over and over again until the job is done. Until everyone in our city knows Jesus or I get called home to heaven, I'm gonna give it everything I've got. That's why we're here, that's who we are. And I'm so honored to have you partner with us in this journey. Today, if you're watching and if you're here, if you're here, if you're here, some of you are here, a lot of you are here, it's really cool. I thought it was gonna be me and my parents. I'm glad my parents are here. I thought it was gonna be us. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> All right, if you're here, and your foundation's just been too sandy, and it's been too scary and too shaky, you can't do it anymore, let me offer you a better option. Let me offer you a foundation that will never forsake you, never leave you, never abandon you, never give up on you, never be tired of you, never tell you that it's not the right time. All you have to do is say yes. An offer was made to you thousands of years ago just to enter into relationship, to know God. Jesus did all the work. He sacrificed himself so that you could be forgiven of every mistake so that your chains could be broken. You could come out of darkness in a marvelous light. If you're ready to make that decision today, if you want that foundation, if you want that peace, if you want that hope, it's as simple as saying a prayer and making a decision. Would you pray that prayer? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Forgive me for all the mistakes, all the sins along the way. I believe in you. I believe you are good. I believe you are hope. I believe you are my firm foundation. And today I give you all that I am. 
every part of me and I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.